Sure. Okay, we're good to go. We're recording. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jamie wasn't able to make it, so he asked me to, to hop in. Um, I'll tell you, this is like my third training this morning. So if I get rambling, this is, a, this is definitely the smallest group I've had. So hopefully this will be a little bit more informal and we can be a little bit more uh, interactive uh, this hour. But um, so I'm the senior uh, internal wholesaler here uh, that supports um, Mario and his team and American Partners. Um, I've been at F&G now for oh, probably uh, at least six months, uh, so I think seven months. Um, I was at uh, a Global Atlantic Financial Group prior to this, working also primarily with uh, Index Universal Life Insurance. Um, <clears throat> so uh, natural fit to come over here uh, to, to F&G. Um, definitely an exciting time, uh, a wonderful product as we'll go through. And, um, you know, like I said, we'll allow this to be a little bit more interactive. Um, I'll go through the website a little bit. I got Mario's uh, agent portal pulled up. I won't go into a lot of the details, but I'll go at least to show you where you can find the e-application and then move on to the illustration and uh, show you a, a couple of designs that I typically see. Um, Give me one moment. I'm going to pull something up and mute, <laughs> put my do not disturb on as I'm getting messages left and right. So, and then we can get started. Do I have permission to share my screen? So, okay. yeah, let me Perfect. make sure. Hold on. Let me make sure I can make you like a co host. I, I see the ability. So, I'm, I'm sure I do. I just, I made you a co host. So okay. you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Can you see that screen okay? Yes, we can see it. Uh, okay. Weird. It's not, not telling me I'm sharing, but um, strange. Um, okay, so you see Mario's name up here in the top right? Yep. Okay, beautiful. All right, good. <laughs> um, so here, here's, your, here's your agent portal uh, where you log in to view all your business, um, where you can run illustrations, where you can do the e-apps, uh, commissions, kind of your one-stop shop here for, for everything. Um, as I mentioned, I'll just go through a, a few things if you're unfamiliar. Um, first things first, there's a button here that gets lost a lot of times. Um, and that's the subscriptions button here. So if you go in, uh, you'll see there's a ton of different lists of types of communications that you can go ahead and click on. Uh, if you want updates on a, you know, whatever it may be, whether it's enforced new business, uh, once a policy has been issued, if a policy has been closed out, whatever it may be. You can go in here and see, uh, you know, go ahead and tell our team how you want to be communicated with and what items you want uh, to have that communications for. So I just want to touch on that real quick because that gets lost a lot of time. Um, so if you haven't gone in there already, go do so and take a peek. Um, obviously, a lot of people want over communication, right? They want to know if a, when a policy is being closed out or they want to know when a policy has been approved. So. Uh, just make sure that's all up to date. I'm not going to go into the weeds of it. You can check it out when you get a chance. Um, but then I'm going to show you where you can go to the eApp training because the eApps are a totally different platform than the illustration training or the illustration software. So um, that's the question I hear probably the most regarding the two is, how do I move on from the application to the illustration? Or how do I just bring the illustration? Where's the button to create the application? There are two different entities and are on two different platforms. So you have to go into online applications here under forms and materials, uh, click on uh, the life. And once you select life, you'll see that there's two different options for you in here. And this is why I'm showing you this. You have 
the wizard application, or you'll just have a traditional application here, which is your top option. The difference between the two is the application that's highlighting in gray right now. That one is just essentially your paper application only in an electronic form. So um, it's as if you printed it off and then just stuck it on a computer, you can type it in and fill it in uh, per usual, but if you were to print out, print it out um, off of this, it'd look just like a paper application. The wizard app is definitely a, a totally different animal. The wizard application is thinks a lot smarter. Uh, it's more reflexive. So based on questions that you've answered uh, up front, it'll then populate uh, new questions for you. So for example, if you hit yes to a medical question, it might automatically then just populate a box for you uh, to answer or to fill in the details of uh, why you mark yes to that medical question. Whereas, um, you know, the other ones that might have a box at the very bottom after all the medical questions to say, if you marked yes to any of these, name the, the question and why you marked it yes. So it's just a lot smarter. And the biggest thing is it allows for Insta approval. And by Insta approval, I mean right when you hit submit, you find out if the policy has been approved. Right now, it's only for juveniles. So although an adult can technically do this wizard app, um, it's really meant and honed in for juveniles because they have the ability right now for Insta approval. So there's two different signing ceremonies with this e-application. One is to get like authorization that we can go into the databases and get information behind the scenes. So we'll go in after we get that first authorization we'll go in and get uh, the MIV um, you know for 16 the MVR the motor motor vehicle records uh, prescriptions and as long as there's no red flags there and you fill out uh, the application accordingly and accurately you're gonna have a good chance that you're gonna be able to to get this approved right when you hit submit um, now where we're going with this and this is the super exciting part is I think we're going to go ahead and raise some of the, the face amounts for juveniles to get into approved. Right now, the max is 200,000 and less. Uh, the reason it's that number right now is because we don't ask for the parents to have double the amount of coverage. So 200 and less or 200 and above or above 200,000, we are going to ask that the parents have double the amount of coverage for the juvenile. Uh, Less than that, we're not even going to ask the question, so it's not necessary. So I think we are going to uh, bump that up. Um, and then also, hopefully down the road, um, I'll knock on some wood here, but at the end of 2024, so this year, we make this available for adults at, to, to some capacity. I'm not sure what the thresholds are going to look like, what the max face amount is, what the max um, uh, age will be, but the goal and where we're headed is to have instant approval for adults uh, to some capacity. So that's super exciting. Um, I can't wait to learn more information about that as these months come along. Um, I will tell you that this wizard app is going to be the only thing available here in the near future for that reason, because we are just planning on uh, having the adults uh, be uh, eligible for instant approval as well. So um, it's really exciting. It's definitely going to be a game changer for us on that front. Um, right now, again, juvenile business is available for that, but adults should be here um, in the next year for sure. All right, I'll stop right there. Is there any questions um, that you have on our e-application before I move into the uh, illustration part? Any questions, guys? Everybody's muted right now in case you are trying to ask something. good okay. all right no worries perfect all right so <clears throat> your illustrations um i wish we had a, a bigger button for this but it's going to be under sales tools whether it's right here or if you hit the drop down um you'll have to click on this friendly looking gentleman here and that'll take you to the illustration software so that e-application platform with firelight uh, illustration platform is uh, iPipeline or iGo. 
Um, so they are two different things. Just keep that in mind. Um, when you get in here, you'll have two options. You can either view the list of cases you've already done, or you can start a new one. We'll start a new one right here. Um, and I'm just going to go through uh, two or three different scenarios, probably the two or three that I come up with the most. Um, I'm sure some of you run illustrations on Insight or WinFlex. Um, maybe you're familiar with that, but there are some things in here that you can do that um, you can't necessarily do on, on WinFlex. Obviously, WinFlex is kind of a just generic tool that's kind of a one size fit all, and they try to craft that around uh, the, the uh, carrier's individual software. But we'll go through uh, a few scenarios, and again, please don't hesitate to unmute yourself and just uh, ask a question as we cross as it crosses your mind. Um, I'll try to pause here and there for questions if I can uh, remember, but um, we'll start off with a, a 35 year old female. Um, and we'll do, just do a simple cash accumulation sale. Um, you can label your client there in case you do go out and you run multiple, let's say you don't have a, a client's name. Um, so you have a bunch of female clients in your system, uh, it'll let you know that uh, when you're looking at all the cases, you can put it here in detail and that will uh, differentiate the difference between the 35 and let's say you have a 40 year old. So um, make the state Iowa, which is where myself and the home office are located. And we're gonna do the path setter product. Um, I'll go back to these. Obviously, this isn't a uh, a product training, but we do have two other options other than the path setter. I'll tell you that 99% of the time you're going to use the the path setter. So um, the Executex rarely ever use the. Um, it's more of a simplified issued product, but the best rate on it is a table table B or a table two. Um, it's really for folks that don't have maybe they're a business owner and they're just incredibly hard to get a hold of and you're like uh they just want coverage they don't care how they get it they just want uh maybe two hundred fifty thousand dollars of coverage hey i i just want one touch point that's it give me coverage and you can go ahead and use that um, but man i've seen it maybe once or twice since i've been here um the everlast is more of a death benefit play iul so um, I think I used it this week for the first time in months. Um, I had a 68 year old that was just looking for the most amount of permanent coverage that they could get. And I was able to get about $10,000 more of coverage using this Everlast as opposed to the, as opposed to the path setter. Um, but again, if you're looking for any sort of uh, cash accumulation play, path setter is gonna be the product for you. It goes all the way down to uh, 15 days old, so uh, an infant, all the way up through age 80. So it has a wide range. Um, any of you that's sold F and G before, odds are it's definitely been the the path setter. So the underwriting classes, there's like a bajillion of them. <laughs> if you, as you can see, um, the most common ones though are preferred and non-tobacco. Um, Non-tobacco is just going to be your standard. Preferred is the highest class that we go up to. Um, we have a bunch of different solves as well. This time around, I'm just going to do the max accumulation and in income, which is definitely the one that I do the most. And it's your typical IUL scenario. Um, I have a certain amount of premium that I want to pay, and I want to lower the death benefit as much as I can and uh, get as much income out of it by the time um, retirement comes around. So for this one, I'm just going to do a monthly premium. I'll just do $1,000 a month. Um, don't let that scare you. It does not have to be $1,000 a month. It can be probably anywhere down to about $50 a month, uh, to be honest, at this age for a 35 year old. Um, we'll pay for 30 years, so to age 65, 
of this cash value is just saying how when do I want this policy to lapse? That's the best way I look at it is I want $1,000 at age 120. So I want this uh, policy to run out all the way to maturity at age 120. If I were to put in 100, this policy would last at age 100 because it's how long do you want this policy to last out until? We'll leave it at, at, uh, at 120 again. It'd be only if you wanted the policy to lapse early would you change that number. All right, here's the fun part with the loans. Uh, we do have a few different options. Uh, loans or withdrawals. The majority of the time, you are just going to do your uh, variable loan, also known as a participating loan. Again, this isn't product training, so I'm not going to get into uh, the difference, but I will say our variable loan rate does have a max of 5%. And why is that a big deal? Because we're not planning on taking money out until uh, age 65, so 30 years from now. So it's really comforting for the client to know that if the max uh, variable loan rate is 5%, no matter what the market looks like 30 years from now, that is going to be the highest that we, we can charge, and that is contractually guaranteed. So no matter what, we are never going to uh, charge more than that 5%. Um, and I think with the rate environment we're in now, that's, that's what it is, um, which is pretty typical. Honestly, this is a, a spot where benefits, it can't ever go higher than 5%. But um, you think to the low interest environment a few years ago, um, you know, we were in like the twos, the, like everyone else. So it does have the capability to go down uh, lower than 5%, absolutely. But um, the max is 5%. And that's probably something we don't hit on and, and use as a competitive advantage enough here at F&G. Um, but it really is a, a lifeline there for your client uh, with volatile markets. Um, as you can see, there's this minimum non-neck and death benefit button. I am not going to check it this time. Um, I'm gonna actually come back to it and check it. But for right now, I just want you to see the difference and I'll explain the difference. Um, if you check it, it's basically post 7702 rules. Uh, which is the basically Department of Insurance saying, here's how much you can stuff into the, uh, an IUL policy. If you leave it unchecked, it's pre-7702 rules, which is what we have. So um, right now, uh, we'll leave it unchecked, and I'll show you the difference. I'll come back to it, check it, and then go over why are some of the reasons you would leave it checked or unchecked. Most of the times, when you come down here to the face amount tier, uh, most times if you're doing a true cash accumulation, you're going to do option A to option, or excuse me, option B to option A. You do that at the time that you stop paying. So we stop paying at 65, and we will change it to option A right then and there. Um, <clears throat> I'll come down and touch on some of the allocations later as well. Um, but before I generate, or as I generate this illustration, are there any questions of, about what I just typed in and why I, I did what I did? Yes, I have a question. Um, okay. I've been, you know, mainly told to just kind of run an illustration um, to kind of assist a client with retirement funds. Um, as a max mm -hmm. accumulation, what is the difference between just choosing max accumulation as the case design versus what you just did right now. Um, this sounds a little bit more specific, um, ma max accumulation and income. Yep, awesome question, thank you. So the difference isn't much, it's really just like it sounds. So we're gonna solve for that income with max accumulation and income where it prompts you to um, uh, put in that loan um, so if you were to do max accumulation, this income stream field and below would not be here. So it's only going to show if you were to just choose max accumulation here, it would only show the policy grow for the life for the life of the policy. It's never going to spit out any sort of income. And I can come back to that too and show you what the difference is, uh, show you how we'd run it uh, at max accumulation and show it without the income too. I can do that. 
Okay. Okay, sounds great. But um, max accumulation, they'll still be able to select, uh, let's say at age 65, to start collecting on a monthly basis, correct? Yeah, it, they absolutely, you know, it's going to be a, a client-initiated action regardless if they want to pull out the income. Um, <clears throat> this is just allowing you to show the income um, on the illustration. It's not setting, it's not set in stone that they won't be able to take the income just because they're using max accumulation. Um, it's just showing you what it would accumulate to throughout the retirement years if you did not choose income. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep, you bet. All right, we'll give this a second to load. Um, I'm going to try to pull it up in a PDF as well so that the numbers are a little more clear for you, for you guys. Uh, as you look at the screen, sometimes it gets a little small if I just leave it. So, all right. there we go. All right, so I typically come down to the tabular detail page, um, and this is where your numbers are. So you'll see it spits out a $590,000 initial death benefit. So that's in your initial face amount. We're paying $12,000 a year or $1,000 a month. Uh, we're paying that over the course of 30 years. We're doing an increasing option. So uh, these numbers on the far right hand column are going to increase with the death benefit. Um, you'll see it gives you three different, um, not columns, but sections that have three columns underneath. Um, you're going to want to focus on this non-guaranteed. That's your assumption. So that's what you assume is going to happen. And that's all based on a historical look back. Um, you know, this guaranteed option is your worst case scenario. We have a floor of 25 basis points. So the worst the client can ever get as a return in any year is 0.25%. So they're at least going to be earning some money in any given year. Um, a lot of a lot of people uh, associate IULs with zero being their hero because they can never go below that. Our hero is 25 basis points in this uh, in this case. So. I'm gonna move on to the second page because it's gonna show you the loans that we are taking out, the income stream. Um, and as you can see, we can take out just under 90,000 for a period of 25 years to age 90. Um, and as you take out those loans, that death benefit is definitely gonna to start to decrease a little bit. Um, but let's say we go down to age 95. Let's say they lived a, the insured lived a, a nice life uh, and they unfortunately passed away at age 95. I mean, this is really what you're going to want to focus on when you're explaining this to a client. You know, you put in $360,000. I took out over $2.2 .2 million in income. So I had a, a gain of almost uh, nearly $2 million. And I also left behind almost $408,000 for my loved ones and my beneficiaries. Um, so that they could have some money as well. So this is the, the name of the game with, with IULs and how we structure them almost all the time. It is your true uh, minimum death benefit over, over funding scenario where you're trying to get as much cash value out of it as possible. Um, you'll see that this account value continues to grow. The reason why that is and why the surrender value decreases, this account value assumes that we never take out loans. So I just had the question of what would it look like if, if we just did max accumulation? Well, it would not show these loans over here in this column, excuse me, in this column. Um, and it would continue to grow in both of these columns here. And you could see, you know, the death benefit would continue to grow as well. That's the difference between max accumulation and max accumulation income. Any questions with this before I go check that box that will do the uh, post MD702 rules that allows you to stuff a little bit more money in? Sir, I have a question on why the loans and withdrawals stopped at age 90 and if there's a 90. way for you to make it um, continue, you know, further into maybe like age 100 or whatever. Yeah, perfect. Great question. 
let's go let's go back to to uh the home page there and i'll show you show you where we can do that so the default on here is going to be starting loans at 65 and it asks for how many years you want to take that loan for and the default gotcha. is going to be 25 yep. years so okay if you wanted to go to 100 all you do is put in 35. Okay. right and then it would just be like a lesser amount spread over those amount of years right that you're taking out as exactly a loan. Okay. yeah yep exactly it won't be extreme like maybe a thousand less dollars two thousand less dollars a year it won't be anything crazy um but it will be a little bit less yes you're correct all right thank you so all that right. was just kind of a default then yeah yep nope great question thank you um now i'm going to check this box so here is the difference. We we're at 590,000 for our original death benefit. Um, you're gonna notice that this uh, gives you a less death benefit. Um, and you'll know, I think we had what, $89,000 in loans, almost 90,000 per year in loans. You're gonna see that that probably this scenario gives you uh, a little more, so. We'll go over the differences here once I pull it up. So as you can see, instead of 590, we're at 319 for the original phase. So what we've done is stuff down the death benefit as much as we possibly could over uh, in this scenario. And now instead of 89,000, almost 90,000 that we're taking out, taking out originally, now we're taking out 96,000 six hundred seventy dollars so they're getting almost seven thousand more dollars a year in income by checking that box so the obviously the big question is why would you not check this box if they're getting seven thousand more dollars of income each year right that's what you're wondering why would the, why would the client not want more money <clears throat> well there are a few reasons. Um, we, we, went, we went over one of them. One is they're losing $200,000 of initial death benefit. So they were to pass away. Uh, unfortunately, in those early years, they would have less death benefit to leave behind to their loved ones. The second reason is really um, a flexibility issue. We're, since we stuffed this down so much, let's say she's, you know, she obviously has a pretty decent job if she's able to continue uh, a decent career, if she's able to contribute a thousand dollars a month. But let's say she gets an even better job where she's able to fund it at two uh, $2,000 a month. Well, you're going to run into guideline issues and potential mech problems if we um, push it all the way down. We're pretty much stuck at this $1,000 a month and can't increase that. So it lessens the flexibility of payments that they would be able to, to put in into this IUL. Now, the third reason um, kind of has to deal with you as the agent. So you as the producer get paid based on this target premium, which is usually around page 17, 16, 17, 18. And that target premium is based on the initial death benefit. So if, you know, if that $300, uh, $319,000 death benefit gets you 2872 as your target, that 590000 is not quite double, but it's almost double. So it's nearly going to double. Your, I would guess that if the death benefit comes to be, or the, excuse me, the target premium comes out to be somewhere around $5,000. I should have checked that earlier. So you, the agent, would be paid off of, uh, that 519,000 or that $5,000 target as opposed to this $2,872 target. So, you know, it just depends on the scenario. It's a case by case basis, right? You don't want to lose the sale. Um, so obviously if you can get them more income and you have to check that box, go ahead. But even if you don't check that box, that 89,000 that we're showing um, on a yearly basis at age 65, is still going to be competitive at 89,000 with other carriers. So, um, you know, I, I probably run into way more uh, competitive scenarios with other carriers than you would as the 
the producer, but um, those are the times that I would always check the box. Or if we needed to press that death benefit down so much, because let's say we're working with a 55 year old instead of a, a 35 year old, and they don't have nearly as much time to catch up and make up for those premiums. So we need all the help that we can get by pressing down that death benefit. So those are the reasons. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense, but I'll, I'll pause right there and see if you guys have any questions before I go to my next scenario. So if, if we were to check off that uh, non-MEC and the client mm -hmm. wants to increase um, later on down the line, um, even if they want to increase their death benefit a bit, is, is that allowed for the client to do? You can increase your death benefit, but the problem is you have to go through underwriting again. So you could make room room for it to increase it by upping your death benefit, but um, you would have to go through underwriting. So as you can see, we're right at we're right up against that twelve thousand dollars a year that guideline um, by the the premiums that we're putting in. So we can't put in any more than. Uh, this $12,000 a year premium. So and if you were wanted to do that, you'd have to, yeah, you have to increase the uh, the death benefit, but that would involve underwriting again, which no one wants to go through underwriting again. I but agree. That just depends on the scenario. Oh, sorry. No, that's go ahead. specifically because we checked off the box for the illustration. Like that's what we delivered to them. So that's what we're saying this is. You can't do anything, but if we leave right. it unchecked, there's room, there's more flexibility to go up or down. Correct. Correct. Because it's affecting the death benefit, right? This is the main driver um, based on the guidelines. So having a higher face amount uh, is going and paying the same is just going to, it leaves more room for you to pay more up to a higher guideline annual. So um, if you guys just kind of want to, take note of these numbers here. So we have 12,000 as the guideline annual, we have 28 as the target, and we have 319 as the initial face amount. I can go back in here and I will uncheck that box. And we can take a look at those numbers. I meant to show you those ahead of time, so I apologize that we could see the difference originally, but we'll go take a peek right here. All right, so we have that initial face of 590 instead of the 319. And now our target is $5,311. So, um, you know, you obviously get paid more based off of that. And uh, the guideline annual has shot up from 12,000 to 22,000. So now we have room up to 22,000 to pay uh, to pay for that, uh, to, to fund the policy, policy with. So that's the difference. That's, uh, you know, again, it's a case by case basis. Um, just depends if, you know, maybe 89,000 is not enough. They really need to hit that, that 95,000 per year is the income they're looking for. Um, then you can press that box, check that box, and that will allow them to do so. But, um, I just want to more than anything, make sure that you guys as the producers are aware of the differences. Um, you guys are, are doing all the hard work, right? And you're doing, uh, you guys need to be compensated accordingly. So, um, you know, if you are in a situation where you need to take a little bit of a haircut and drop the target, you guys get paid a little less. What I always say is getting paid that 2,800 is still better than getting paid zero. So, uh, just use your judgment and, and uh, choose accordingly uh, on an individual basis with a client. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, isn't it true though, if you do not, if you do not click that non-MAC, the, the um, shrink down the initial death benefit that they won't be able to mm -hmm. take advantage of, of the uh, 7702 um, 
uh, rules or the favorable um, tax treatment when you when you withdraw the money? Oh no, it's it's still going to be a, a tax uh, free event when you take out these loans. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, it's just you're right. just getting less. I mean, that's, that's right. Case. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying. Yep. yep, you bet. Okay. Yeah, all that all that box is going to do is affect this space. Um, so, um, <clears throat> pre seventy seven oh two, this is this or seventy seven oh two b, what whatever the the new one is. I, I apologize, but pre pre this last change on this, this is what the minimum was able to be. Now we're able to set the minimum a lot less, but um, and stuff more money into it. Uh, in other words, because if we had, if we had a five hundred ninety thousand dollar death benefit pre seventy seven oh two, this would have been the max that we can stuff into it is twelve thousand dollars a year. Well, now we can stuff um, twenty two thousand dollars into it if we need to. So that's that's the difference, and so. Um, you know, I typically run it, if I'm going to be honest, typically I run it without checking that box unless they've reached age like 45 is usually a good uh, good age to at least keep in mind. And um, then in there, they just run out of time um, or time starts to get shorter. So I have to make sure that they're still getting a decent amount of income and to make it worth it. So that's when I start to look at checking that box. Sometimes it's 40, um, but um, it, it totally just depends how much premium I'm working with as well. Um, I'm gonna go down and show you guys our strategies. Um, I usually do this in between scenarios. So 50% of our strategies are allocated into our high cap S&P strategy which has an illustrated rate of 7.08% and has a cap of 12. And then the other half is gonna go into our proprietary volatility controlled strategy, which is our Barclays Trailblazer sectors five. And that's about the 50th time I've had to say that word today. So I'm glad I can still spit it out, but, um, that has, what's neat about this Barclays strategy, this volatility controlled strategy is um, it's uncapped. So it does not have a cap to it. It has a 170% participation rate and it incurs a 1% bonus starting in year two. Um, but if you know about volatility controlled strategies, you're probably like, well, that's what's, what's the catch? Um, there's really not one. Uh, we don't have any sort of fee or charge or trigger with this strategy, like some other carriers do, where it hits a certain uh, threshold or has a certain trigger that uh, forces a, a charge onto it. We don't have anything like that. It's just, it's targeted to be right around that 5%. So unless volatile market's gonna hopefully be there right around that five, that's what the target is. Our assets, within the strategies are rebalanced on a daily basis to allow for um, that flexibility to, to rearrange, to keep right around that 5%. Um, but it's also seen a lot of upside in certain years. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, I think over the last three or four years, to be completely honest, it has not done great. Um, it's been right around 6% or less. Um, but if you go back to, uh, the fifth year, 2018, um, I think it was at 26 or so percent. There's there's a historical look back on the illustration, um, but it was in the mid 20s. So that all pretty much makes up for it, and um, you know it's still right around that five to six percent. So um, just keep that in mind, right? It's a it's a marathon, not a sprint. With these, um, don't be discouraged if in certain years either. The, s p or bar this Barclays strategy hasn't performed it's it's never gonna be uh gonna be right at seven every year it's gonna hit the floor some years it's gonna hit the cap some years um with the Barclays strategies if it does hit the floor of twenty five basis points it still has the ability to get up into the twenties which is really neat 
um, and there's proof that it's it's done that in the past. So uh, I think these two are best performing um, historical look backs from an historical look back anyway, best two performing uh, strategies. Are there any questions with these? Those are the two main hitters there. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but do you have any, anyone have any questions over the strategies that we use? Or how Is that typically, that's typically what you would recommend to do every time? Typically, um, yeah, I, I like the, um, you know, I like the stability with the Barclays um, with that upside potential, but, you know, the, the S&P over the last 11 years has done an average of probably somewhere around 12. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the, the S&P isn't a bad option. Uh, if you've been locked into that from an investment standpoint, you've, you've definitely felt that. So what I'll tell you is, Mainly every producer leaves it at these. Um, not a lot of times is this switch. If it is changed, it's because um, they just put it in 100% in either one or the other. So they're either mm -hmm. just a believer in the S&P, so they'll put 100% each. But yeah, that's that's probably what I recommend. I just I like my uh, my eggs in a few different baskets. So um, a okay. fixed option down here is pretty high actually for a fixed option. Um, I remember when I first got here, I was going to pull it usually somewhere either four and a half or four point four and a quarter, um, four and a half or four and three quarters is, is pretty high. But if you do want even more uh, uh, conservation or uh, stability, fixed option, you can always choose that. Um, but if you hit the between the two, the 7.08 and 5.61, you'll see that it came to be 6.35 is the illustrated rate on that. And I can point that out too when we do our next scenario. But okay. thank you. You're welcome. All right. All right. I'm just going to do one other scenario for you guys because this is also um, probably the uh, second most common one, and it's usually with a, a juvenile. Um, so I'll just do a a juvenile, um, we'll make it a male, let's say he's one years old. And I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned Insta approval earlier with the EAP, about 25% of our business um, is actually with juveniles. So not a huge money maker for you as a producer, but we do do a ton of them. There's a lot of upselling opportunity, um, right? It's, it's an easy sell. If you are selling to a parent or a, a grandparent, you know, it's an easy question of, do you have kids? Do you have any grandkids? I can show you what $50 a month looks like if you want to see that real quick, if that's something you're interested in. When you think about anywhere that you go, um, whether it's, you know, the one that comes to mind for me and most often is if you go somewhere to get your oil changed to a, a Jiffy Lube or whatever, right? They're always upselling you with, um, you know, can we change your air filter? Can we change this? Do you want to rotate your tires? Whatever. They're always trying to upsell you to get more money. Um, there's no reason for you as a producer to not do the, the same thing, but you guys are the professionals. You could probably do that a lot better than than I can. Um, but just keep in mind, there there is a marketplace for for juveniles, um, and we are really really good at really good at them. So um, just keep that in mind when you're in your next appointment, um, especially because these numbers tend to speak for themselves when we when we go through it. So uh, we'll do the same thing. Max accumulation income. We'll say that someone wants to start their college funding early, let's just say that they want to put in $250 a month. Again, I'm not trying to scare you. That has to be $250, or $250 a month. It could be $50 a month. That would, that would be fine. Um, we're going to pay to age 20, we'll pay to age 22. And we will start income right after that to help pay for college. 
So typically what I do, um, especially because it looks way better, um, is I encourage parents to go ahead and take those loans for their kids if they need to, and then have something there to pay it back when they're finished with college. That way it's not earning that interest with each year that passes by. Um, right, instead of going ahead and just paying, taking out loans at age 18, at age 19, at age 20, 21, uh, pay it all, take those loans. It's, it's not a terrible thing. And then have this uh, money pool to, to take from to pay back those loans that you took for the, the child's college. So I'm also going to solve for a second solve at retirement. Like, hey, let's see how much we can get out of it then for the, the child's retirement to help supplement that. Um, again, for children, I'm never really going to check this box because. I know that kids might have the possibility to, to increase their income later down the road or uh, the premiums down the road, right? You might start off at $50 a month, then it might be able to jump up to a hundred and then they get a oh, good paying job where they uh, finally settle down, have a, have a, a spouse, a, a house, a good paying job, and now they can contribute $300 a month. So, um, that's why we never check this box for juveniles. Um, it's more meant for the, the older ages. We'll do the same thing, option B to A, and we'll change that when we're done paying, which is age 22. Um, it's automatically gonna, I didn't touch on this, but it's automatically gonna solve for your face amount. So we don't need to touch anything in here. Don't need to touch anything on this premium section because in our solves, we're already doing that. We're already inputting our premium. We're already doing our income. We're solving for our faith. So everything is gonna be done right here. The only thing that we need to do is change our option B to A. All right, so let's go in and see what this produces for us. I really don't have a scenario that I do consistently. <laughs> I kind of just, just spitball it every time. Um, so I, I truthfully don't know what the numbers are gonna kick out. Um, I just do a lot of these. And again, this is something I do do, do a lot of because we do get a lot of requests for, for children. Um, so if we go down to our tabular detail page, we're paying $3,000 a month. Um, it's gonna give us this high face amount of 411. Now, again, the parent, typically does have to have twice as much. So I'm gonna pause right there and say, this might be a good opportunity where you do check that box. You know, I just said maybe, um, you know, you, you'll have two options. You can lower the monthly amount or you can check that box and push the death benefit down. It's not gonna allow for more money to come, uh, to be put into it right away, but um, it will at least allow the sale of the policy, which is most important, right? You still wanna see the, the the, set, the sale happen and get that child covered and supplement for college uh, college planning. So we put in $3,000 a year to take out 1000 to help repay loans at that time. What you'll notice also is we don't, we stop paying at age 22 and we don't continue payments at all the rest of the time. It's done with, so it's over. So we took out 110, let's say they took out $25,000 a year for loans. Um, probably wishful thinking nowadays, but it's um, maybe you have some sort of nest egg that you could use to, to pay for college um, or you don't pay back all your loans, whatever it may be. But let's say you do take out $25,000 a year for, for college, uh, for loans, you can pay that back essentially all at once here at age 23. And then the policy will still stay in force. You know, age 30, maybe they get married. They already have that death benefit. In case they have kids um, to leave behind to their family. And then we go all the way down to age 65 when they do want to retire. Um, it touches a million dollars here, but they have $78,000 that they can take out to help supplement their retirement again, all the way to age 90. So it's a 
this is the powerful story. We took out, or we paid $63,000 into it total. We took out over $2 million in investment of investment gain of over $2 million of this policy. And then again, they still have something to leave behind to their loved ones when they do pass away um, at, at any point. But this is this is where I kind of just let the numbers speak for themselves. Um, it's a great, great uh, tactic to keep up with inflation, right? Because it is tied to, to the market and S&P. So, um, it really is a really cool tool, especially for for um, for parents who have never seen anything like this before. So, any questions with this? I know we're getting really close to time, so I want to allow for as many questions as, as I can. I just have a quick question in regards to the loan interest. So, mm -hmm. when the client starts withdrawing here at this, you know, 78 grand or whatever, and they don't, yep. they don't pay back that loan. Um, they're being mm -hmm. charged 5% every year. Does that compound or how does the interest on, is it, no. I guess my question is, is it going to be charged from the death benefit, um, the with the withdrawal and the interest rate? I'm trying to figure so, that out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So our variable loan is a participating loan. So um, let's say you have let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars. I'm just going to make this real simple. This isn't the scenario we're working with here, but uh, let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars of cash value. Let's say you want to uh, take a a ten thousand dollar loan, leaving you with ninety thousand of cash value. That that loan of ten thousand dollars is going to have a a, a five percent uh, loan rate to it. So, but it also is participating in the market. So it's also that ten thousand dollars is also able to earn uh, money within the whatever strategy you have, the S and P strategy. So it has the ability to uh, participate in the index. So that's why a variable loan is most times. Uh, called also a participating loan uh, as opposed to that fixed index. That's why we don't typically see fixed indexes. Uh, it might have a, a lower rate, but uh, that uh, what you take, let's say you did take uh, 10,000, that $10,000 on a fixed loan would not earn any money um, onto it with that $10,000. Only that $90,000 is going to start earning interest uh, and crediting. So. Um, is it compounded? It's not really compounded. It's just on the loan that you take each year. Yes, it will be a, a 5%, um, a 5% uh, loan on, on each loan that you do take out. And then um, it would be subtracted then from the, the death benefit if you didn't pay it back. But most, most people are not paying that uh, variable loan back. And hopefully we have what's called uh, positive arbitrage is usually the word that's used where your loan that you took is still that 10,000 loan you took, hopefully it's um, earning 7%, right? That's what we're illustrating. So hopefully it's earning that 7% while we, own, while we are only charging 5%. So in that case, you're going to have a 2% arbitrage or still a 2% gain. So even that loan that you took is still actually earning money. So that's, uh, you know, we're right up time, right up on time. And that's probably maybe a little deeper of, of, of a conversation, but you can always call into our sales desk um, or to Jamie and I, and we can sit down and discuss that with you. So hopefully that's a, a little helpful. Maybe yeah. I made you more confused. Hopefully not though. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any last minute questions guys before we let Curry go? Um, if you can just provide maybe yours and Jamie's phone numbers in case there are additional questions. Um, I'll be putting some illustrations together um, for tomorrow. So that would be good. Yeah, to have. Absolutely. Um, I will, is there a good email that I can shoot off when we're done? I'll have a. Uh, Curry, um, do I have, I might have your, let me double check. Mario might've sent it. Is yours, or I have your emails. It's C-U-R-R-E-N dot Hoff at FG Life. All right. Yep. Me, I'll it's email you with my, name. Yeah. yeah, I'll email you with 
uh, from my email. If you could just shoot back all of your contact information and I'll get it out to the team. Yeah, uh, yep, exactly. I'll probably send some other uh, items there as well, resources for you guys. Um, That'd be great. I know we just covered a ton of a ton of information in a, a short amount of time. So uh, I appreciate you allowing me to come on and share a little bit about our software. And hopefully uh, if you run into a, a cash accumulation opportunity, you go ahead and give F&G a, a look. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Curry, so much for all the information. It was definitely helpful. I know um, probably a bunch of us have been using FNG, so thank you so much. We appreciate awesome. your time. You're very welcome. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thanks, you everyone. Too. You guys have a great weekend. Cool. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all.